My first question is um, why is effective political and civilian control of the military essential to democracy? Well, I think I'm going to quote uh, Samuel Huntington, uh, which is from a book called Soldier and State. And uh, he writes that it, in order to provide proper subordination of a competent professional military uh, to meet the, the ends uh, that are established by civil, civilian authority, um, that's why you need to have effective control. And I think that sums it up pretty well as to uh, why, we, uh, why we search for that then in a democracy. Um, that's what we strive to, to have. And what does it mean institutionally and or in substance? Well, I think if you don't have that, then you end up with a military in charge, and some people would call that a military dictatorship, and I think that that's not what we would be looking for. What do you think of the process of the establishment of political and civilian control of the Hungarian military after the regime change in 1989? Well, the first word I would use is that it's been challenging. Um, I think that uh, um, once the, uh, the uh, Russian military was leaving um, in 1991, by uh, the late spring, I believe, if I remember correctly, obviously there was a process going on um, within the parliament and with elections and Uh, I think it's been a learning process. Uh, I think it is not only for Hungary, but I think for every democracy, it's always a learning process because um, it evolves. And as new challenges arise, you have to respond to those. But um, I think the biggest challenge in the beginning was where you had a foreign entity that played a large role in political and military life in Hungary. As that ebbed away, you then had, or the government and the military then had to learn um, or step out on their own. Um, obviously there were people that were there to provide assistance and we'll talk a little bit later I think about how the United States and some of the roles that uh, as an attache uh, I played in that. But uh, challenging uh, I think is, is one word that uh, I would use to uh, encapsulate uh, the what what needed to be done and what was going on uh, as this transformation took place. What was your experience when you first confronted this issue and in what capacity? Well, I can go back to 1956 when I was uh, uh, not quite a teenager and watching the news uh, that uh, had the Hungarian Revolution uh, on newscasts with tanks rolling through the city. So that was That was sort of my first introduction to Hungary, and at that time, of course, I never thought that I would be serving in Hungary twice for a total of seven years. Um, but um, more professionally, from 1990 to 1991, I was a student at our National War College. And as part of that studies, um, students could select areas of interest. And so my interest area was um, what we called Central Europe at the time, which was Hungary, Romania, and Yugoslavia. And we actually came to travel to those three countries in the spring of 1991. Um, we didn't get to Yugoslavia because things were not going too well there and the State Department wouldn't allow us to go. So we ended up spending some extra days both in Romania, which got us all the way north to Brasov, uh, and also in about uh, a little over a week here in Hungary. And so it was, a very interesting for me to, to be here and sort of solidify some of the things that we had been studying in class and seeing firsthand in Hungary. Um, I think uh, after that, as I mentioned, I became in 1995, I became the air attache in 1998, then the defense attache. Uh, and then um, in sort of a second career, after I retired from the Air Force in the year 2000, I joined our Foreign Service in 2001 and was fortunate to come back to Hungary in the political section of our embassy from 2007 to 2010. So I was able to, uh, to see it from two perspectives, both from the military perspective and then also from uh, more from a political uh, perspective in that second position. Oh, and then I came back 
in 2010 until I retired in September of 2011, I was a Hungarian desk offer, officer, a reference in the State Department. So. Um, so I, I, I had not only seven years living in Hungary, I had a year studying Hungary back in the early 90s, and then I had almost another year and a half uh, working on issues from the State Department uh, perspective related to Hungary. And what exactly was your job in supporting this process? Well, I think as an attaché, uh, it really had to do with evaluating capabilities, readiness, civilian and military leadership uh, qualities related in particular at that time to Hungary's interest in joining NATO. So when I first got here in the summer of 1995, that was the start uh, of that. Um, and of course, shortly thereafter, we had the uh, Dayton Peace Accords, uh, which meant that um, the U.S. forces were looking for places to uh, sort of a transition or partially bed down, uh, moving south into the Balkans. And so that, um, took a great deal of time and effort as well, negotiating with the Hungarian uh, government, um, both with the military and the civilian side, um, to, to make that happen. And uh, fortunately, Hunger, Hungary was very um, willing and accommodating to allow us to use Tassar Air Base, um, which was uh, very important to us because it provided, uh, I think, a, a good path as we moved forces down into uh, into the Balkans to to help uh, enforce that peace accord. <clears throat> what were the most difficult problems you had to confront? Well, I think like anything, um, when um, when you are in this kind of a position, in particular as an attaché, it's all about developing good relationships. And uh, so that's a challenge. And I was fortunate to have uh, a year of Hungarian uh, from all of 1994. I just studied Hungarian. And so that certainly helped. Uh, and to work those relationships with, with not only senior civilian and military individuals, but also down at the lower levels. So I could go out to a base and just talk to a, a young troop. Uh, I remember going to Ketchkamate one time and uh, talking to uh, 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 a, uh, a technician, military uh, young uh, soldier who was working on uh, MiG-29 engines, and so I was talking to him about that. And so I think that um, one of the advantages of at least having some capability in Hungarian and again trying to work a personal relationships was what needs to be done, and that, and that takes work. So that's what I saw is um, my challenge to better understand, I think, the dynamics of uh, the Hungarian political and military situation. And what do you think how the United States have influenced this process in Hungary? Well, I think significantly. Um, I, can, I can think about um, the Partnership for Peace program where the state of Ohio and the United States had a direct relationship and, and um, had people that would come over to work with the Hungarian military on different aspects of, of, um, of, of military, I guess, life and how you organize and train to Hungarian troops going uh, over to Ohio as well, other, other, other states as well. Um, I remember it was, I think, General Dayak one time. We were out at um, uh, Tukul, let's see, uh, on Chapel Island, right? And we were sending a contingent that was going to go down to Louisiana for a training exercise. And, and you could just feel the emotion that he had as he was watching his troops now going to a U.S. Army base for training in the United Sta States. And it was... Yeah. It was um, it was an interesting and moving moment, I think, for all of us to, to see that occur. Um, in addition to that, we often brought senior um, civilian Department of Defense and military officials that would come over. We had um, conferences, we had seminars um, that would go on. We worked very closely um, with the Hungarian military on developing a non-commissioned officer corps that would, that would not mere, but be similar to what we have in the U.S. military, to where we um, we give a lot of authority to non-commissioned officers. And I think under the previous system, 
um, that wasn't the case and so we tried to encourage that you have a lot of potential there and you could have non-commissioned officers doing some of that work that uh, that was then being done by officers and they could be freed up to do other things that would be I think more compatible uh, with the rank that they held so um, and then um, the, the the NATO referendum is an example in 1996, if I remember. Um, one of the things that I did, and some others in the embassy did it, did as well, I remember one time going to Liljefred up near Nirechhaza, and there was a public forum uh, that had not only some officers from NATO, but from the embassy and, and other entities. And so I was provided an opportunity to talk about that in a, in, a, in a little speech that I did in Hungarian. So I think there were multiple areas where we were trying to provide uh, things to think about, processes to think about, organizational structure to think about. Um, and it was just a continuing process uh, throughout the entire four years that uh, that I served as an attaché. What do you know of the current situation in Hungary? The current situation in Hungary. Well, um, as I said, I was back in Hungary from 2007 to 10. So, you know, I was there when we had a little bit of a. If it was a crisis, but with the prime minister, where we had sort of an interim one between Prime Minister Jurchan and then um, Gordon Bonai uh, was served for a while, and then we had the elections. Um, as I watch what's um, what's going on there, well, first of all, I think that I remember even back in 1990, 1991, thinking that. This process is going to be almost a two-generation process. It's not something that would happen within five years, ten years. It's still going on today. And, and I think that you had a whole generation that wasn't born or was just born in 1990 that didn't live under the under, uh, other system. Um, but you have a generation still young but had. And so... Um, it, it's a process that takes time and like I said there's always tweaking that goes goes on there's modifications there's there's changes that are made um, and that's okay I, I do have some concern that uh, in the recent years I've seen some sense that there's trying to uh, put some limits on civil society non-governmental organizations international ones for instance um, and even the CEU, uh, that I think that it it just concerns me a little. That is is the government trying to muzzle or to 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 downplay uh, or minimize? I, I think discussions across the political spectrum, um, because I think in a free society um, you need that kind of discourse. You you need to have the uh, proper respectful exchange of ideas and uh, I'm just a little concerned I'm not sure where um, the current government is going in particular when uh, it classifies itself as an illiberal democracy um, you know back when I was growing up um, anything behind the Iron Curtain was always viewed as Eastern Europe and then I remember coming even in 1991 and even when I served here it was no we're in the heart of Europe and um, which is true um, but I'm just uh, a little concerned that we might be facing, uh, to facing a disease of the heart, and I hope that's not the case.